The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Welcome back. I know we're sort of getting into the middle of the week. Some of you maybe want to keep your laptops open to work on other courses midterms, but I will ask you to try to focus on blockchain and money today. Um, uh, today we're going to chat about permissioned versus permissionless systems. I want to thank, I, I have a guest here. I, I call out guests when they're here and I know him. Mark Snyderman, um, who runs a fund at Fidelity. Mark runs a six, about $6 billion called the Real Estate uh, Income Fund at Fidelity. And you might say, well, why does he want to come to a blockchain and money course? It's because we went to high school together. <laughs> so, um, and uh, uh, I was at his wedding, and he's getting married again next week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but you can all inundate Mark later about Fidelity, because he's been there for a lot of years. <laughs> see, see what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm shamelessly for MIT and MIT <laughs> students. Um, so uh, let's, let's uh, get going. I was, I was letting a little bit of time for a few more people to wander in. Uh, today we're going to talk, uh, of course, we're going to chat a little bit about the reading and study questions. Going to go back again to what are the technical and commercial challenges. And this is relative, this is relevant for all of our lectures, but it's particularly relevant today because we're going to be talking about two different database structures. One's the permissionless blockchain of Bitcoin, but now today we're going to introduce and go deeper into the permissioned or private set of blockchains like the IBM Hyperledger and Corda. But the technical issues relate to all of that. Um, and then, of course, we're going to talk about that against a third type of database, traditional databases. So aligning permissionless, like Bitcoin, permissioned IBM Hyperledger type of and then traditional databases, and why in a business setting you might think of one versus another versus another. And I'm sure if I run off the rails anywhere on traditional databases, which I have not personally studied, Aline will help bail me out somewhere. Is, is, that, a, is that a deal? Maybe? All right. Um, yeah, I asked for it. Um, Mark, Aline is a... a as a computer scientist from other parts of MIT, so he helps me out in subjects I don't know, and even in subjects I think I know. <laughs> um, so, so let's just start a little bit with uh, the, what did you take from the readings? There were four or five readings, of course, but what is a permissioned or private distributed ledger? Now, I can do this. I can light them up, as some people said, because Talit has given me my, my list. Um, uh, but, but again, class participation, anybody who hasn't spoken yet might want to sort of chime in and give it a shot. I, I'm not seeing any volunteers. I'm not get, oh, yes. Do you want to tell me your first name again? Uh, Jayati. Oh, Jayati. Jayati. Okay. Um, so uh, the permissioned uh, DLTs, unlike the permissionless or trustless ones like Bitcoin, they limit the number of participants. Essentially, they require the participants to be authorized before they can enter into this uh, technology. And in addition to that, uh, they are said to be stakeholders. And since they are the only ones involved in verifying the transaction, instead, unless uh, unlike the permissionless ones, where it has to be verified by all the nodes, this limits the uh, 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 permissions required to hold the stakeholders which increases also the transaction speed. So it's like the, the triangular, the, uh, the, the, the dilemma we learned about, about the security and decentralization and the scalability. So it moves closer away from decentralization towards scalability. Okay. So uh, 
Jaita. Jaita. Um, went through a whole lot. It's about the number of nodes and permissioned into it, and that it addresses some of the, that Buterans trilemma. So at its core, it sort of addresses some of the scalability issues, but it does that at a trade-off that it's not truly open. It's not anyone can write to the ledger. I mean, that's sort of the fundamental things. Anything else that folks took out of the core readings as to how it separates and how it's different? I mean, all right, we'll get, get a chance to add a little bit. And then we're going to dive into uh, Hyperledger and Corda a bit. We'll talk about digital asset holdings. What's digital asset holdings? Anybody know this company? Well, Alain knows it. Brodish knows it. Alain. But, so, Alain. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's basically a competitor for uh, They're trying to build a uh, DLP protocol that will allow financial institutions to exchange information and value. And uh, they started, in, to my understanding, in 2016, which is two years after Park Recorda, funded by CD, J, uh, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. They raised basically the same amount of money, $110 million. And, and who, uh, other than Eileen, Elon, can tell me who runs digital asset holding? Just, it shows that you did the reading. Somebody have not uh, Yes, Priya. Priya. Yes, um, Blight Mass Masters, or Blight Blight Masters. Masters. Yes. Right. Does anybody know what Blythe, who, who Blythe Masters is and what she's famous for beyond digital asset holding? Uh, she's at JP Morgan, and did she invent the CDS? Yes. Credit the default swaps? So she worked at JP Morgan, and she's known around the world of credit default swaps. Jillian Tett, who some of you, uh, the Sloan Fellows, will get a chance to chat with Jillian Tett in New York in a few weeks. Uh, Jillian Tett wrote a whole book about credit default swaps in J.P. Morgan, and, and Blythe Master is a central character in that whole narrative art. Um, and uh, this is what she's doing now. She's brilliant, and she's a very good businesswoman. Um, I ran the Commodity Futures Trading Commission and had an opportunity to, to meet with her a lot because she ran the, uh, the Swap Dealer Association, ISDA at the time, or was the outside chair of ISDA, if I recall. Um, and then we're going to talk about the business trade-offs as well. Uh, but what, what do you think some of the central business trade-offs, if I could get two or three of you to help me out on, what are the central business trade-offs uh, between permission and permissionless uh, blockchains? Let me see if I get somebody other than Priya. Yes, you remind me your first name. Sean. So the permission blockchain have better like privacy protection and better uh, scalability and no mine no mining is needed in uh, permission. So let's let's pause for a minute. So better scalability. Better privacy and and the third point you're saying? Uh, no mining. No mining or mining is associated with this proof of work. Any other business trade off? Uh, so for Permission, you have sort of more flexibility with governance. If you need to make changes, you don't need to rely on the consensus. So more flexibility of governance, in essence, because if you have a club deal or a group deal, maybe you can do that governance changes amongst the group instead of having thousands of people participating. Kelly? Um, there's also like a key technological differentiator, which is um, the coding language sort of that the inputs can be made in. So with Hyperledger, um, they can use the smart contracts in any <coughs> variety of them versus the alternative, which is um, the domain-specific language. Right. So Hyperledger at least promotes themselves in their own write-ups, because the, the reading was really from them, <laughs> that their, their embedded language is much more flexible. And you can use Java, you can use Go, and so forth. At least they say they can. I, I, I don't know if it's really as limited in Ethereum, but they think uh, and they promote that they're more flexible than Ethereum. So Kelly's right in that, too. Um, so these were the readings. And now, so 
we're back to basics again. What is a blockchain? <laughs> I know we've spent four or five lectures on it, but these key components, let's start. Append only timestamp logs. Are they both, uh, by show of hands, are they in permissionless blockchains? I hope every single hand goes up. <laughs> are they in permissioned or closed blockchains? I'm, I'm watching. I'm not putting, I'm just going to watch. All right, every hand should go up. So both sets of blockchains have this concept that goes back nearly 30 years to our friend Haber, you know, who started uh, the whole blockchain that's in the New York Times. This whole concept is in both sets of blockchains. Brodish. So I have a question about this. If we uh, kind of equate append only to immutability of the ledger, uh, then I think I read in one of the readings that Corda has a feature where you can make some changes to the history, uh, which is not equivalent to a hard fork. Uh, so that will probably be one example where it is not purely append only uh, in a permission block. So Brodish is raising that there are certain features that are promoted in one of the private blockchains, Corda that may allow you not to append only, but in essence, delete data or, or replace data, uh, possibly. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, because there's also in private blockchains an ability to partition, and in essence, sh it's a kind of a form of sharding, but to, to partition the data. I don't know enough about Corda whether they literally allow you to de delete or is it, is it something in this partitioning? But maybe Hugo? I was going to raise a similar point that if, I mean, to my understanding, if you have a permission system and there are only a, like a small number of, we'll still call them nodes, then can't, like if, if you realize you did something wrong or something needs to be changed, can't they all go in and change that? If, so if so Hugo's now. raising the point, if you're down to like three nodes as, uh, I've shared with you all the Australian Stock Exchange is putting a permission blockchain up using digital asset holding, which I think is backed by also the Hyperledger fabric technology. But if it's just the Australian Stock Exchange and it's one node or three nodes, couldn't they just change it on all three? And I think in essence, yes. I mean, that may not be what the database structure is, but I still think it's it's potentially yes. Um, so as you get more concentration, you have more chance. But Brodish, I will try to research the Corda thing um, more specifically. Other thoughts? So then you create an auditable database, some database with cryptography. Hash functions, which half the class said they understood, and the other half was sort of, you know, uh, a, a, a little Rough one, all is in permission systems. Using cryptographic schemes to ensure for the validity of the data and, so to speak, the immutable nature of the data. What's different is consensus protocols. In essence, it all goes down, except for Brodish's point maybe about Corda, uh, as to who gets the chance to add the additional data. Is it a small club deal, or is it broad, wide open? Everybody together, roughly? Um, so back to the technical features. Remember, it's a bunch of cryptography. Uh, love it or hate it, it actually allows us all to use the internet, well past, obviously, the uh, blockchain that we're discussing in this class. Network consensus, and then all the ledgers. So both permission and permissionless have ledgers, have cryptography. It's that middle bucket that's different between the two. So what were some of the challenges that we talked about in uh, blockchain? We, we just talked about them 10 minutes ago, but just what's the list again? See, this is the easy part. If you haven't spoken yet, this is like the easy questions. Oh, I'm... Um, Hopelessly shameless. Yes. Do you want to say your first name so Talita takes you off the list? 
No, you want to say it louder because Talita can take you off. All right, so scalability and some time, so efficiency and scalability. Anything else? Privacy. Privacy. So it's basically the scalability of the privacy are two big things that permissioned systems address. Interoperability, basically, how does, how does this blockchain talk to other blockchains, or how does this blockchain talk to other legacy systems? Permissioned and permissionless systems both have issues of interoperability. However, the smaller the club deal, the more likely that a bank or the Australian Stock Exchange might address its interoperability right within the system. Whereas if it's a big open source, open project. So IBM would say we can even help you with interoperability. IBM would say we can help you with all four lines. We can help you with scalability, efficiency. We can help you with privacy. We can help you with interoperability and governance. I think it's less clear that they can help with all four, but they can certainly help with the first two. Um, and Alon, you've switched from using a permission list to a permission system in, in your startup, right? Which of these four is the reason why you're switched? So actually, I switched. Or something else. Something else. So for me, it was a business use case. So I was trying, my, my business is selling to banks. So that's the next line, commercial <laughs> use case. There it is. <laughs> There's a setup. So what was the reason that you're switched? So I was building on Ethereum, which is public, and I thought that it's unlikely that in the near future, banks are going to adopt Ethereum as their underlying technology. And then I learned about R3 and Corda, and learned that banks actually funded that project, so I switched to where the banks had put their money. So I would contend that it's a bit about interoperability. You felt your users would be more likely to be able to, to work with your system if you were using Corda, which they were, which which they were familiar. Correct. That's the so there's a business reason and technology technological reason. And then of course there's the public policy reasons. And IBM would even say that they're going to score higher points on the public policy if for no other reason that there's better privacy and security. Now, I'm not trying to shill for IBM. I'm just saying these would be their selling points, uh, or Corda or elsewhere. Um, uh, we talked about Buterin's trilemma, but in another way, uh, many people would say decentralization competes with scalability and security. If you want scalability and security, you can't have decentralization. I, I'm not a tr big believer in this trilemma, even though I've now raised it twice, but it's often talked about in, at blockchain conferences and blockchain papers and business discussions. So. Uh, I've always told you I want to be a fair representation of the debate that's going on. Um, I think it's more possible to solve these three over time together than some others. But maybe I'm just a cockeyed optimist about technology. Um, so uh, public policy framework, what were the big three slipstreams? I went fast last time, the last class. Leonardo, what, what are you going to tell me about the? It's because you were adjusting your glasses. Yeah. Uh, no, we spoke about the difficulty to, uh, to implement uh, framework. And we were talking more about the, uh, the need to look for adoption, offer security to <coughs> protect people. So to protect people, so it's sort of a privacy thing. I think I have a hand hand up here from Catalina. Um, there are like three big things that need to address the public policy: working against illicit activity, illicit activity, financial like financial instability, and protecting the investors. There you go. 
All right, so you know my style. I try to drop things into three buckets, but it's the only way I can remember anything. Uh, but it is the three big buckets, of course. Um, and since I went fast last time, and we're going to be coming back to a lot of it, but were there any questions that you have? And this is just an opportunity, Brodish. So I had a question on the financial stability point. Uh, like you mentioned that because of the overall uh, value of the digital currency is uh, very minimal compared to, let's say, all securities or even the gold reserve. Right. Right. So the, the value of, 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 financial, of crypto finance is about $220 billion right now compared to worldwide capital markets that in aggregate are over $300 trillion of debt, bonds, and uh, equities. Right. So uh, my question was more like to understand your opinion on this, that this value is also concentrated in a, within a limited number of people compared to the other assets that we are talking about. And uh, hence, it, I mean, it, it can still be important to regularize on the financial stability side because it can have an effect which is not in proportion to just the size. So Brodish is asking the question that even though it's only 200 billion versus 300 plus trillion dollars of worldwide financial assets, couldn't it still be relevant to financial stability? And the answer is yes, but it's still relatively, it's less than one one thousandth of the broad size. Yes, please. Uh, Better you than me. So, <laughs> so basically we did an analysis between the correlation between public market, the, the mood in the public market versus the, the Bitcoin market. And basically there's a, there's a correlation of roughly 80 to 85%. Uh, when, when the public, uh, when, the, uh, when the Bitcoin market's down uh, within the past year, the public market is likely to, to move down because there's a lot of leverage built into the system. And uh, when, once that the, uh, the volatility kicks in, uh, a lot of the, uh, the investors got margin call and they have to get money out from the public market. And that kind of feeds into a loop. So you're saying there's correlation and there may be feedback loops. Uh, Tom? Uh, sort of a related question. So Mervyn King was in this room a couple hours ago, and he was talking about in the 08 crisis two issues of trust. One where there was a counterparty trust issue, banks, even though the overall derivatives market was even, banks didn't individually know which other bank was most at risk, and so they wouldn't trade with each other or lend to one another. And then on the opposite side, the, the, the solution, the salvation was two people in a room trusting each other that the central bank, that the government would fund billion, tens of billions of dollars to inject capital. And so I wonder your thoughts on <coughs> blockchain's role in addressing that first problem of knowing your counterparty or at least being able to trust their position, and then the risk of eliminating the second chance of injection of capital into the financial system in a blockchain. Um, Ross, I had a question that's related to this. All right, which is um, thanks, for I see how you don't know. But the, the question <laughs> is this: it, it, it does strike me that you only have a financial stability problem if people are relying on the the value of people's Bitcoin holdings, for example, which is the bulk of crypto assets. Right. The the reason you have the problem during the crisis is you have all these banks. They're carrying these assets on their balance sheet, and all of a sudden, people think they don't know what they're worth. Right? Who, if anyone, is actually carrying the Bitcoin assets on a balance sheet that someone else is relying on? Or, to put it differently, who's extending the leverage? Let me wrap these together. I think that what the what many central bankers and the Financial Stability Board would say at 200 billion versus 300 trillion, it's probably not that financially relevant at this point. Where it could get relevant is, as Ross has sort of uh, suggested, is this if there's leverage behind it. If it's in a balance sheet, it's an asset on a balance sheet, and there's a liability on the other side, and thus it could bring down that, that entity, whether it's a, a hedge fund, whether it's a bank, but, but something that's relying has, has to, to tie it back to the questions that uh, Tom raised is, could blockchain lower systemic risk? Possibly, if it's a better database solution. If it, if it answers, 
what Mervyn King was speaking about, we also addressed in the late 90s. I, I remember it quite well when Secretary Rubin called a number of us into his office and said, I don't understand. The banks can't tell us their exposure to Korea. A number of countries, South Korea was about to have, they, they didn't default on their debt, but they were coming close to the defaulting on their debt. And of course, it was only a short while before other countries like Indonesia and Thailand were getting into that same debt uh, challenge. Um, but why couldn't banks t tell the US Department of Treasury their exposure is usually through derivatives. And derivatives, both in the late 90s and in, in the financial crisis, were often something that uh, propagated risk through the system. Now, the numbers were larger. I mean, uh, depending upon the time, the 90s was less than this, but it was three, four hundred trillion dollars of notional amount of derivatives. So just the, the sheer notional size, even though the capital at risk in derivatives was much smaller. It was because the leverage of this notional, big notional size. And the transparency was pretty low. It wasn't zero, actually. It wasn't zero. But it was really low. <laughs> and um, uh, so I think that's what Mervyn uh, King would have been mentioning. And I do think blockchain can help in that transparency. Um, but it takes a big collective action. And so Europe, the US, and Asia, a lot of laws were passed to get more transparency in the derivative space. Um, British, I would say that there could be problems. And I've had, I've had conversations with elected leaders that say, don't get lulled into the sense that it won't have financial stability issues. Uh, because that was what happened in the 1980s and 90s when people said, well, uh, derivatives will not create instability because it's only, it's only the, the institutional investors, the sophisticated investors, the, they're, so to speak, big boys or big girls, you know? And, and, and um, I, I was part of that. A deba those debates, that consensus that formed uh, that it was only institutional and it wouldn't. But there was a lot of leverage and a lack of transparency when big leverage, multiple hundreds of trillions of dollars associated with it, um, it of course was part of the crisis. Not the only part of the crisis, but any other questions before we, Hugo? Yeah, uh, on the protecting the investing public front, um, I was just wondering, like a lot of People are now using Robinhood and, and zero fee things like that to invest in the stock market. And uh, companies like Robinhood and Vanguard often sell order book data to high frequency traders so that they can kind of know what's going on and maybe front run. Um, so I was wondering how that fits into the, uh, to, to what we were talking about last time, where there's no uh, transparency on many of the. Block, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, and then in addition to that, um, big institutional investors can, I think, buy like upwards of five percent of any stock, and then wait a few days before they have to um, before they have to report on that. So that can also have a huge effect on like stock price, and then they can afterwards dump on people. So like, how how is that different from? what's going on in cryptocurrency exchanges. All right, so that's an investor protection one. Was there another one in the, is this investor protection or? Uh, no, it's a little different. A little different. All right, any other investor protection? Because I'm going to collect them and then just enter. Uh, Paul Palmer, I, I was a little bit, it was kind of extra to me when you say um, the blockchain can help to stabilize the financial market. Right, so that's back to financial stability. Yeah. All right, it can, can I hold it? Let me just answer Hugo's, yeah. it's investor protection one. So um, all markets, not just crypto markets, all markets are susceptible to some forms of front running. In essence, if you have a client relationship and you get information from your client that might affect the, the market pricing, you might jump ahead of that client with their information. Their information might be a buy order, a sell order, or frankly, it might be some other information. But traditionally, if they have a buy order or a sell order, you have information, and then you're sort of jumping ahead and you know, saying, all right, I'll buy or sell in front of them. That's the classic sort of front 
running, even though there's other methods. Um, it's not supposed to happen. On regulated exchanges, you have uh, some policing of it. Even before government stood in, you could have some policing of it in self-regulatory organizations. Um, in the crypto world, there is, you know, Katie bar the door, anything can really happen. And it's my belief and understanding that many crypto exchanges, not all of them, not all of them, but many crypto exchanges are basically trading in front of their customers. Um, and in fact, m most crypto exchanges make markets. There's, they are both market makers, meaning they are buying when you're selling and selling when you're buying. That's the nature of a market maker. It's a very typical, very legal, very important function of market. But the exchanges are both market makers and then they show order books. And so it sort of helps them do front running. Uh, not that a lot of people necessarily agree with me. I think these markets would be better off if there were some forms of rules about front running and manipulation in markets and the like. On your 5% question, can we take it up at uh, office hours or something? Because it's sort of outside of crypto. But I would be glad to talk about the SEC rules about the 5%. Is this investor protection? And that I think so. The reading that we had that talked about the fabric technology, it mentioned something about execute, order, validate. Does that mechanism tie into the way that front running would work? At all? All, all blockchain technology, whether it's permission like fabric or, or permissionless, can, if it was if it was efficient and scalable, could help out because you could actually time stamp when did the order come in? When did the client's information get to the exchange and is somebody standing in front? So it's sort of like a cascade that you can't necessarily like pause once it starts. Right. right. So if you look at the, the, the algorithms at the New York Stock Exchange right now, which are not blockchain, they're not permissioned, and they're not permissionless blockchain, but if you look at the, both the algorithms and the data flows, they have very good time stamping. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but they have very good time stamping to ensure when or orders, basically message time stamping, every message that comes in. And some order books, like the New York Stock Exchange, some order books are price and time priority. Price priority, meaning high bid gets hit before the next bid or lowest offer gets lifted first, that's price priority. But they might also have time priority for any bid that has the same price and any offer that's the same price. So they have to have very good time stamping. It's not, it's, it's not per, you could not use, I truly believe you could not use a blockchain solution for the New York Stock Exchange order book right now. Whether you can in 10 years, I'm not sure. but. Time latency is so relevant in the middle of those order books, you know, the nanoseconds that matter. I want to take this stability question. There were two stability, and then we're going to move on to the rest of today's lecture. <laughs> You're having fun now. Can you explain a little bit more about, like, well, say, uh, if blockchain can be a better database so it can help, uh, like, stabilize the financial market? I, can you give some example? I don't so, how blockchain could possibly help be a stabilizer. A lot of, of financial instability, or beyond the financial markets, instability is a question of resilience. And when, when things are centralized, you, you create single points of failure in any system, it really in any, it, it, military or financial. You, you centralize something, you then thus you, you, you know what to attack. You can also maybe have higher walls or better moats, but you still know something to attack. So blockchain in its decentralized nature might be a more resilient database, because even if half or two thirds of it goes down, you still have the other third. I'm going to say something about the New York Stock Exchange again. Whether it's the New York Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, they all are required by their various local laws to have backup data centers. And those backup data centers even have to be 
lots of miles away if, God forbid, a bomb comes and takes out the center. What's that? It's called, it's basically disaster recovery. So maybe blockchain will be more resilient. I know I'm going to take two more questions and then get back to permission versus permissionless. Wait, back in the corner. Your first name again is? Matt. Matt. Thank you, Matt. I should know that. I'm, so I'm kind of just curious how, like, the essentially the nascency, for lack of a better word, the central, like the, the nascency, how kind of like new and and this market is, how that affects policy. Because when you're shaping policy, and you don't necessarily have like a bunch of years of of knowing how people are going to react to that policy, I feel like it could almost be a chicken and egg. Okay, I understand. Any anybody else on the, the same theme? No. So the question is. How does it affect policy makers when a whole uh, technology is new? And I would say uh, we have a lot of history with this. We have a, whether it was railroads or the telegraph or the telephone or television, we have a lot of history. Um, technology and commercial applications move ahead of the public sector. I mean, it just, it's just inevitable the official sector, the public sector, unless it just basically does what Mark Carney says in the choice is to isolate something, to sort of put up the moats of a society and says we can't use that technology here. Unless you have that, technology usually supersedes the, the markets and the markets and technology come before official sector. Uh, depending upon the area, it can take single digit years and sometimes decades for public sector to catch up literally, but let's take the internet. The internet was being worked on for 15-ish years, uh, but the, the, the protocol layer that helped take off was the World Wide Web in 1991 or 92, and then the security protocols in 96. Just taking financial regulation, the SEC was asked in 1995 could bulletin boards, there, were, there were, were electronic bulletin boards listing stocks and bonds, be exempted from being considered stock exchanges? Well, the people that were asking that were the people putting up the bulletin boards. They didn't want to be regulated. The New York Stock Exchange, it was fully regulated, and NASDAQ, that was fully regulated, was coming at the other side and asking the SEC to shut them down. They didn't want the competition from the disruptors. It took three years for the SEC to answer that question. I don't mean answer it like with a letter. They had to propose a rule, and they had to do a final rule, and it was three years to, to do that. In blockchain, I think we are through some of the big questions. We know how most jurisdictions tax, T-A-X, tax it as property and not as currency and some of the tax issues. We know in most jurisdictions how it fits into broadly Bank Secrecy Act and illicit activity. There's very choppy implementation, very spotty implementation. I would say the investor protection side, we're at the early stages and it's going to take in most jurisdictions another three years maybe to sort through some of how to, and this is just crypto finance. I don't know, Matt, does that, that's just, I'm giving you some predictions. Some of it could be multiple decades. We're still today trying to figure out, the public sector's figuring out how to regulate Facebook and Google. I'm going to take one last question, because i got to do permission. Sorry, I kind of had, because I was kind of like, it kind of answers the side of like following the technology, but I think for me what I was kind of wondering about was this, the way where like as soon as you apply regulations to something that at least a good portion of the market seems to value being deregulated, it seems like a lot of the activity will change either in scope or scale. So Matt's raising, uh, there's, a, there's a trade off about bringing something under regulation or into the public uh, policy sphere. Um, I'm probably just one voice of this, but I think it's probably true. There's very few economic activities that grow large that stay fully outside of the public policy framework of a society. It doesn't mean that public policy frameworks don't change, get adopted, get adapted. 
the internet comes along and at first it's a question of, you know, with Amazon, is it going to be taxed or not? Is there sales tax? And then later, you know, it's, at first it's not, later it is. And in some jurisdictions, uh, questions on the internet was liability. And this is a very critical question of early internet was, was there liability for any of the information or the flow uh, of information? I'm talking about libel laws and all the liability issues and so forth. And so in the U.S., there's a section of the law in 1996 was passed. Uh, and now we're coming back and saying, wait a minute, that gave too broad. It was basically exempted the Internet from liability as carriers. But now that was modified in 2018, 22 years later, to say, well, if it has to do, I think, with basically child trafficking and slavery and everything. Maybe, maybe that's, we should tighten that up a little bit. Um, so I don't believe any broad economic activity is going to remain outside, bro fully outside public policy frameworks. Uh, uh, and and uh, I'm glad to be challenged on that. But I, and, and I think blockchain and particularly crypto finance is at this grappling stage to get in. So let me move forward, because this is more about permission and permissionless. I just wanted to cover some of these. We will cover initial coin offerings and the public policy issues around initial coin offerings and the Howey test. We will cover crypto exchanges, and we will cover central bank digital currencies a lot in the second half of this semester. And um, so back to the trade-offs that we talked about uh, already, the, the trade-offs of centralization and decentralization in Coase's work from the 1930s about the firm. This is the cost, remember. This is the cost. As we get centralized, there's more cost of economic rents, single points of failure, and capture, some fragility, in a sense, in the system. But Decentralization has its cost as well. You'll notice that these two lines are crossing somewhere. It was my failed attempt to say, you know, maybe there's a balance. Maybe overall, while some organizations will find all the way to decentralization and some decentralization, I think economic systems tend more towards the centralized side of things. But you can change the slope of these two lines if you want. I'm just trying to give you a framework of thinking about. Um, so as, as we've talked about, the financial sector pretty much favors permission systems. The financial sector is saying, going back, no, nope, too many costs of coordination, governance, security, privacy, and scalability. We're, we're over on the other side. Um, and, and so that's where they are today. I'm not sure that's where they'll be in five or 10 years, but it is definitely where they are today. Um, so let's go back down our, our list, in a sense. Where do you think I'm going to? I'm going to have a bunch of check marks and X's on the right. Where do you think I'm going to have check marks and X's? Uh, this is the same three big buckets, because I can't think of anything. Emily, do you have a point of view? I mean, I think in terms of the permission te technical features, one of them is obviously that it's not using that proof of work. Not it's not using, using the same proof of work. Not using proof of work. So I had to give away the, you know, reveal the curtain. All the cryptography that's used in permission systems or permissionless systems is used in the permission systems. It might be used a little differently. I'm not going to say the Merkle trees are exactly the same, but all that broccoli we were eating a few lectures ago are relevant on both sides. Um, sorry, Aline. Um, what's that? You, you like broccoli, a computer scientist speaking. Um, everything, though, about digital signatures and hash functions and so forth are relevant to both of these but they're not necessarily relevant to every traditional database, which we'll talk about in 10 minutes or so. Um, but as Emily said, there's really not, I said no, there's not decentralized network consensus. I'm stretching it a little bit because permission systems can be decentralized. There could be five or 10 or 20 
you know, nodes, and so that is decentralized. So I, I shouldn't have really said no, I should have said maybe or hybrid. Um, and instead of proof of work, the permission systems use a bunch of consensus mechanisms, and I just listed a couple notary nodes or, or uh, uh, PBFT for uh, Byzantine fault tolerance again. Uh, but they don't have native currencies. So that's the big, that is a very big difference, no native currency. If you have a solution for your final projects or you have a solution for some entrepreneurial business that you're going to do in the future that you want a native currency, you're probably more over into the permissionless world. If you want to have an incentive structure, something to motivate customers or users or create token economics, token economics is more in the permissionless I say more because you can create a token even in the permissioned space. We'll talk about it in a moment. And then transaction script or UTXOs. They're not technically UTXOs in a bunch of permission systems, but you need some ledger. This last box, if I just called it ledgers, you'd still have ledgers in. So it's really the consensus mechanism in the middle, as Emily said. Uh, a couple key design features. Um, first, membership's limited to basically an authorized set of nodes. So does anybody want to say if, if, if you were a bank, who you might, you know, what, what's a, what, what might you do if you were a bank and who might you authorize if, if you're doing a bank, I don't know. Um, let's say that it was um, uh, loans. Or if it's Mark Snyderman's real estate, it's real estate loans. Could you ever see real estate loans going on a, a blockchain, Mark? Uh, loans, maybe. Loans could. All right, so, so loans aren't traded as much. So if real estate loans were on a permission blockchain, who might be that membership, the limited? Who, who would, I, I'm, I'm, it's not just a, rhetorical question. Who would actually care about the database of the loans? Uh, broker dealers that are active in loans, invest, institutional investors that are active in loans. Uh, so the broker dealers who are actually trading the loans and maybe the investors, Elaine? Yeah, just the rating agencies when you securitize those loans. Um, loan servicers. Loan servicers. Commando loan, loan servicers. So maybe loan servicers, maybe the rating agencies. So it's basically who has, who has a need and needs that data. I'm not sure that, that this is the right community, but it's the discussion I'm thinking about. And again, as you're thinking about, I'm, I'm jumping again to a little bit final projects, but when you're thinking about you know, who actually needs data and who has a reason to amend the data or write to the ledger. Because if you don't have a desire and a need to actually amend or change the data, move value in the system, you might not need an open database. When we were Please. talking about that additional layer of blocks, is that layer also, can you change the membership with that layer? I, I'm not sure I follow your question when you say an additional layer of blocks. Oh, no, I'm sorry, layer two. Can you alter the, because it's like a different level of refinement of information that's stored? So, so what Kelly's asking is, is we've talked about how to make blockchain, permissionless blockchains more scalable by having a layer two, like the lightning network. That's what you're referencing. So in permissionless systems, it's open to everyone, even though if you're opening up a, an individual payment channel in the Lightning Network, it's really just two counterparties opening up a channel. So in a sense, you've already narrowed the scope because you might just have a payment channel between two parties, some side chains or multiple parties. Lightning Network and payment channels tend to be two parties. So I don't know if it was that what you're asking? network in and of itself is like a mechanism of membership? Um, 
the layer two can be a membership. That is correct. But it's a technology that's available to everybody. So it has attributes where you can open up bilateral channels. James? I was going to say, for permission blockchains, couldn't you imagine that the layer one would be, say, the Fed with all of the big commercial banks, but in effect, if you're thinking about a different layer, you could have another layer on top of that, which are just central banks. So you can naturally have right. two layers that deals with. So where we're, we're headed is, is do permission systems have the same need to have a second layer as permissionless? And even if they don't have the same needs, might it actually provide something? So I would say I don't think they have the same need to have a second layer because they're, they're more scalable, they're more efficient right now, and they're already closed clubs. But even if they don't have the same need, they might actually want to put a second layer on top. And some of them actually do this right in their technology. And, and, and uh, it's what I put up here as the second and third bullet point. The transactions can be limited to only authorized known participants. So in many permission systems, it's a one broad technology, might only be 20 people that can authorize transactions. But now in some transactions, it will only be Anton and me. And in other transactions, it will be Alpha and Amanda. I mean, and so I might not be able to, you, by the way, Alpha might be Goldman Sachs and Amanda might be Barclays. And then it might make more sense. And Mark might be Fidelity. And I don't know, I, I, am I the US Department of Treasury in this one? Um, Mark and I both started out in finance. I just went off to public service later. Um, but so, so Corda and Hyperledger and many of the private blockchains literally allow for partitioning right in the blockchain. I don't know if you'd need to put a layer two on top because they allow for partitioning and segregated pools of authority inside of the blockchain. I'm sorry, there is a question I thought. Oh, yeah. So, Mark, do you see insurance companies like Title Insurance as part of this? Can you speak up? I don't know. Companies for Title, for the house. Sure. I think blockchain could be really helpful because sometimes you have the trust issue around who owned the house before you or the title, where it goes backwards in history. So I think um, Title insurance companies will be part of this blockchain and there's opportunity. So your point is, is that titling of, of real estate could be uh, an important part of blockchains and it's... Probably someday, but every little town has its own system for keeping property records and getting them all to cooperate in a blockchain kind of solution seems like a, seems remote. They don't think they have a real problem that needs solving. So, yeah, maybe someday, but I, I doubt it will happen anytime soon. But it, it makes some logical sense. And that would probably be a permissionless system because there's not a huge amount of times a piece of property uh, transacts, right? So it's not like moving money around the world. It's, much, it's a much simpler, less frequent uh, event. Yeah, and land records are public. People often have to go to the town town offices to look at them. Yeah, you have to pay a lot of transaction fees, whether you're transacting on a plant or anything that involves real estate here in the US. You have to pay a considerable amount of fees to the title insurance companies. And in my mind, that could eliminate that role if you have blockchain and it is proved via the system. Maybe, but you're paying money because you're asking Somebody to them <coughs> and lawyers to clear the, to make sure the title's free and clear. Yes. And there's all sorts of claims on a title to property. Mm -hmm. Somebody that fixed the roof or the utility company that has an easement through the middle to put, you know, uh, lines and so forth. And uh, so there are some complications uh, that are different than just transferring money. So to, to bring it back, to broaden it out, uh, the, the it's really, hmm? 
Rehem. Rehem's question is, is, well, what about real estate and title? Might that be appropriate? And as Mark has given us a sense of, yes, it might be, but we're back to that sort of thing of the collective action issues that we've talked about in previous classes. The collective action of many municipal uh, authorities that keep the land records, to keep the real estate records. Yeah, it might help, but why do I need to do this? And it's also a second thing, it's a low volume, low transaction. And yet, it could be an enormous benefit because there's something called title insurance. And title insurance trying to clean up the title and making sure that something is free and clear could be recorded in the future. So I'll be a long-term optimist. I don't see this one being solved in the next handful of years, single-digit years, particularly because of the darn collective action issues. I'm sorry we have somebody here who's going to take the other side <laughs> before I give my conclusionary you know, estimate. Yes? Yeah, that's exactly my startup. The first phase is uh, <coughs> collecting all the data from, uh, from all those communities, departmentals, tax searchers. The information is there publicly, so yes. They will not probably immediately adopt a quarter node and record their stuff, but you can publicly pull that information and then use that information and record that information on the blockchain. And then once I become stronger uh, and bigger, then they will, they will probably have to adopt it. All right. So, I, so maybe I'll move up my estimate from double-digit years to single-digit years, but I think it's going to be, with all respect, some time. Sometime, Priya, then I'm going to move on. So on this, um, I used to work at Habitat for Humanity International, so access to proper land rights or land title, that was a big issue for us overseas, not so much in the U.S. And so I could see a real application there where in several countries where there is no land record or there are no title systems or they're buried in layers of obfuscation. This is a great solution to get something like that started in those contexts where you know, there's uh, you, establishing the property right of record is could be of immeasurable social value. No, I, I agree, and I think there's a there's a, been a tremendous amount of literature in the last 24 months around whether blockchain can help free up a lot of illiquid capital. In <laughs> essence, um, I'm just saying I'm probably closer to Mark's thinking than to a lot of thinking. I think it's going to take some time. But depending uh, on the context, right? In a context, context, the country, the system, the legal system, how decentralized uh, and how tough the collective action issues are. So just going back to private blockchains, technical features. Let's go back. Membership limited to authorized nodes. Transactions can be partitioned as well. To Ke it's kind of Kelly's point. Right in the technology, you can partition and segregate information. So data and ledgers can be partitioned because transactions can be partitioned. That doesn't mean you can't have a layer two. I'm just saying there's a lot less need for a layer two because they do it in the data structures itself. The consensus is permission private protocols. They do have a consensus. Somebody has to agree on the next block, um, but it's, it's, it's a tight, limited group. It does use cryptography, but often there's somebody, something called a registration authority. The registration authority is helping mask data. So they address privacy two ways. They address privacy because it's a smaller group they can actually see the whole network. But even within the network, even on the network, they're further addressing privacy that alphas in my transaction, Amanda maybe can't even see even though she's on the network because it's encrypted. And then there's sort of what's called a registration authority or, or uh, authority within the system that can unmask it. Uh, yes. I just have a question about the how is a segregated sort of a subgroup of two uh, different from a layer? If the, if the subgroup of two is already doing some netting off of calculations or whatever it may be, transactions, and then the net get, re get, get booked into your.
All right, so I've got another question I have to follow up on. I have to follow up on Brodish's Corda question and now James's question about, well, wait a minute, how is this partitioning different than a layer two? And it's beyond my knowledge, but I'm going to see if I can get it uh, for you. But it's a good, they're both they're, uh, good questions. And then uh, smart contracts, yes, smart contracts can happen on these systems as well as uh, permissionless systems. Uh, 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 IBM's, they say they use chain code, but they say chain code really could be any language, um, they, at least they s s advertise, and no native currency. So that's kind of the technical, not deeply technical. It's not like learning hash functions, but yes to cryptography. Well, they partition the ledgers. <laughs> the consensus is closed loop. Yes, they have smart contracts. Um, uh, but they can even have additional privacy, but it comes at a cost. There's, there's a, an authority that has to protect something, a registration authority inside of it. Oh, I forgot. The code is generally open source. It does not have to be open source. Hyperledger is open source, but it doesn't have to be open source. Um, so this was, the, this was from one of the readings. I'm just putting up that chart that was in the reading, and I just found it helpful. It's a different way. It's not Gensler's way. It's somebody else's way of thinking about Ethereum, Hyperledger, and Corda. I'm only using Hyperledger and Corda because they're two of the biggest private platforms. There are many others. Um, different programming language, you might say, from a business point of view, who cares? And to some level, you're probably right, but you're not completely right. I mean, there's probably more that people can write on top of Hyperledger Fabric. They say more developers could work on that than Solidity. Um, governance, uh, that's the governance of the system itself. Uh, they all can do smart contracts. We've talked about consensus. And, and the scalability is much t harder. Ethereum, remember, almost crashed on CryptoKitties last December. And I shared that story about one initial coin offering was 30% of the Ethereum network on the one day it was closing. So, um, DTCC, in a given day, can do as much as 100 million transactions in a day. That's the Depository Trust Corporation. Um, Ethereum does about a million and a half transactions a day, and Bitcoin about four to 500,000 transactions a day. So, you know, we've, we've still got a ways to go um, uh, on the scalability. Um, so what about traditional databases? I think that to talk about permission versus permissionless, a lot of People, even some of my colleagues here at MIT says, well, if you're talking about Hyperledger Corda and, and a Fabric and Corda, it's just a, that's, that's like Oracle. That's just a traditional database. That's not really blockchain. The, the Bitcoin and blockchain purist would say, if it doesn't have Nakamoto consensus, forget it. It's not, part, it's not a member of the club. That's not how I've chosen to teach that this class, as you know. <laughs> I think both are relevant, possibly, to business solutions, and it's worthwhile to think of them. But so what, 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 what se separates, and this is not in the reading, so I'm just going to, you know, kind of, but what separates it versus a traditional database? Well, back to the basics. Permissioned private blockchains have append-only logs. You're adding, I know, I know. Thank you, Brodish. We'll figure. But basically, they have append-only logs. Traditional databases, and I'm at the edge of my knowledge. You can create, you can read, you can update, you can delete. But you know, again, I'm taking the mainstream traditional databases, or what's called CRUD, if you wish, C R U D. Um, whereas these. You always are adding to the database. Two, these databases use cryptography to have commitment schemes. I mean, remember, what is a hash function? It not only compresses data, but it means you're committing to the data. 
And when you finish the New York Times crossword puzzle, you can actually send it in, and if it's identical to it, and hash it, and if you remember our discussion about the New York Times crossword puzzle, if it's hashed and the hashes match, voila, you solve the, the New York Times crossword puzzle. So you can have commitment schemes for the data. And it can be distributed. Yes, Joe Queen. So even if it's append only, uh, if you take away the proof of work, you can rewrite it in, in a very quickly uh, manner. So Joe Quinn's raising a very important point. So even if it's append only, you get rid of proof of work, can't somebody go in and rewrite it? Permissioned blockchains make a different trade-off on trust. Permissionless systems say, we're going to address trust through this proof of work and at least 51% of all of the network has to, in essence, agree and validate and the like. Permission basically are saying, I'm going to trust the 10 or 15 or 20 nodes that are in the system can validate against each other. And, and the, so there's, there's something about the club that's authorized in the network, but they're still using a pen only. You're right that it's within those 20, somebody could try to rush through and do a whole entire new append only. But then within the club, it's exposed. If, if, we, if the club agrees that the last two days have to be rewritten, they can do it in a very easy way. Correct. But I would contend that even in Bitcoin, if 10,000 nodes decided to rewrite the last two days, they could. It's it take them a lot of time because they have to yes. find. That's find correct. That's correct. So what Joe Quinn's saying is, in Bitcoin, what protects against that is partly the proof of work and partly that it takes 10,000 or at least 51 percent of them probably to rewrite the last two days. The economic incentives in Bitcoin is is why waste all your computer power and electricity and so forth doing that when you may as well just go forward. I think Bitcoin could be susceptible to state actors. I think you know, if North Korea wanted or Russia wanted to spend probably single digit billions, but at most maybe 10 billion, they could overwhelm the whole system and, and bring, they could do a 51% attack by buying up enough uh, mining equipment, the ASICs, and just Big footing the whole system, but it's multiple billion. And there's ac there's academic papers on this now. It's single digit billions a state actor could. An individual wouldn't want to do it because you'd crush a hundred and ten billion dollars market cap down to. Very, so that would be kind of unwise. Um, this is a very critical part of what a. a private blockchain, to me, economically, what a private blockchain can do and facilitate better than a traditional database. I'm not saying this list is the only list. I'm not even saying this list is completely the right list. This is list, Gary Gensler's list, trying to say what's the business that separates traditional blockchains. Append-only time stamping. Some cryptography and schemes that makes the data immutable. So you can put it in a, a ledger. So it's back to ledgers and so forth. And thus, finality of settlement. Does anybody want to remind the class what settlement means? Anybody? Take a shot. Where's my accountant? Aviva's not here. Oh, please. Mm -hmm. It's to do with no, forget about UTXO. Just tell me what settlement means. Like netting off the debit and credit. Yeah, debits and credits. Settlement means changing the data in a ledger and, and doing it with finality. In essence, do I have $10 or $11? A payment settlement system is when you finally say, I've got $11, no longer 10 and Amanda's got nine, 
dollars instead of ten. You went down, I went up. Is that all right? Thank you. You'll hear a lot about clearing and settlement. The word settlement means to finally change the data in a ledger and that we're not going to come back to it. It's done. It's final. If we're moving something of value, and the value could be grapes, the value could be diamonds, the value can be real estate, the value can be money, but if we're moving something of value and, it, and, and storing it on a ledger, it's more adaptable to blockchain. If you're doing some database that has nothing to do with things of value and ledger, you don't need final, final immutable settlement, I would contend you probably have less reason to use any of this blockchain stuff. Zan. Can you maybe talk a little bit about a real world imp implementation of this? So I saw recently that Walmart is forcing their suppliers to in basically add themselves into this private blockchain to, tr to, to basically track your supply chain. I'm having a really hard time understanding why that needs to be on a blockchain, whether permissioned or non-permissioned, and why that needs to be. So uh, the, the question is, why is Walmart putting supply chain with a bunch of agricultural products on a, a blockchain? Agricultural products are something of value. Uh, what, what it's corn, wheat, grapes. Uh, it's something of value. And when it moves from one owner to another owner, if you keep that on a ledger, you can record that Amanda has the grapes and Gary no longer has the grapes. And the, another thing that blockchains help with is they lower the cost of reconciling multiple databases. We could keep, as in agriculture, we can keep separate ledgers, separate databases. Um, the, the farmer is keeping their database. The, the, uh, uh, the wholesaler with the grain elevators are keeping their database. And up the supply chain from the farm to the grain elevator to the, the millers and merchants, all the way to General Mills, all the way to Kroger and the store. You, you, right now, those are multiple databases that by and large don't have to communicate. So the question is, will, will Walmart get to the place where that's a good idea? But I'm just pointing out, if, you ha if you're moving things of value where you want to keep final settlement, that you, you, you know who owns that thing of value, in ledgers, and lastly, if you want to lower any reconciliation. If, if there are multiple ledgers, if you have multiple ledgers and things of value, blockchain, I think, is more valuable. Zan's asking, well, is that Walmart? I don't know. We're going to find out. Uh, Tom, and I've got about seven minutes to finish. Sure, was a talk last year. Somebody came in and talked about the, they were then piloting this program. But the example they used was in a coli outbreak in their spinach supply, rather than taking a whole supplier, an entire wholesaler offline and recalling all of that product, through the blockchain they could trace it to a particular farm and a single point of origin almost instantaneously and just take off a much smaller portion of it. So let me do this. Let me just hold. I know we've got two questions here. Let me, let me just hold. Just for, Is that all right? All right. We've got permission. So we talked about, this was what we talked about earlier, COSA's uh, trade-offs of costs. Let, let me try another one, which, which is going to be my shot at blockchains and traditional databases. So one is access control. Who has access to the ledger? Who has access, if I might, to the data? Three different types of approaches we talked about. Open permissionless, multiple per permissioned, and client server. I'm using the word client server just to say traditional database. You can use another t words, but I'm just trying to say three different types of data structures. And to Zan's question, why would you be in one bucket versus another? And I'm saying this, if you're a venture capitalist one day and somebody comes into you with a blockchain you know, solution, this is the same thing. Hopefully, you'll make it better. This is just my approach to it. Public blockchain, do you need basically public write capability that lots of people can write to these ledgers? Do, do you need that somewhere? 
Secondly, do you want some peer-to-peer -peer transaction capability across the distributed ledger? Do you kind of not want any central intermediary? Maybe you don't want the central intermediary because they're slow and sluggish. Maybe you don't want the central intermediary because they have a lot of economic rents. It doesn't matter to me why you want to get rid of the central intermediary. But if you want to get rid of a central intermediary or lessen their control or lower their control, raise peer-to-peer -peer transactions, have a lot of public writing. Oh, and by the way, if you want some token economics, you're probably somewhere over here. I'm not saying you have to have all four. But to me, those are the kind of th three or four things that are floating around why you might be over there. Private blockchains. Well, maybe you actually don't want public write capability. You need private, whether it's just the Australian Stock Exchange or 15 to 20 club deal. You still want kind of multiple people to write, but you want it to be private. But if you still need finality of data in an append-only log, that you, you need this appending the log, and you need some public verifiability, that you still need that data to be verified amongst, and this public means 15 or 20 players, but you need it to be able to be verified. So the trust mechanism is not thousands and open. The trust mechanism is 15 or 20 or five parties, but you still need it. You might be there. Where I come out is there's some cases that you just don't need any of this. There's a trusted party that hosts the data. Your trust mechanism is one party. The trusted party can do that. I use the letter CRUD. That's the create and, and, and uh, update and delete uh, and, and so forth. Um, and that's based on client uh, service architecture, as client server architecture. There's always in that circumstance somebody right in the middle that basically owns, updates, governs that whole architecture. My business judgment on this is if, you've, if you're moving things of value, you want those things to value to have some final settlement and, and immutability. And immutability append-only logs give you some of that final settlement. We talked very briefly about a lawsuit that was 300 plus years ago, the Crawford case in Scotland. That, that uh, you won't have to remember it, but this, watch this. So steal this from me. Just do me a favor. Just steal it. Okay. Right now, I have a right of action. But if you give it to, who are you going to give it to? I don't have any rights against you. No. Well, wait, it depends whether he knew you stole it from me. But it's gone. It's part of, it's fina that's final settlement. Those $2 are gone. That's, that's final settlement. It's immutable. I can't get them back. What, Christopher? You want them? I just was asking for the money. <laughs> You're asking for the money. I just use that as a visualization. Money is a social consensus and a social construct. But if you think of it in terms of ledgers, look, the money's gone. I can't get it. It's, that's it, you know? That's good. You're, you all go to Sloan, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it's an important concept. I think, I think of this whole uh, that way. So there were two questions, and then we'll, and then, and then this is the decentralized end. Bitcoin and Ethereum are kind of at the decentralized end. I would contend Bitcoin's more decentralized than Ethereum. And centralized databases. Initial coin offerings that we'll talk about later, I think, are actually maybe a little bit more centralized even than permission blockchains. But we'll, we'll get to that. No, mine was already answered. And then the other comment was more about the supply chain. Like When you think about the millions and millions of dollars, the element of transparency that the blockchain kind of brings in to all the parties probably saves an insane amount of money to what you're talking about, kind of reconciliating yeah. all yeah. the databases. So. I, I sort of, we're, we're going to talk about finance next Thursday and some of the strengths and weaknesses in finance and some of the attributes. And you know, one of the readings, Sheila Baer, and there's a bunch of optional readings about what's happened after the financial crisis and so forth. And then we're going to talk about the economics. But I, I've had a few, I've had three or four groups come in already talking about the final project. So I'll just say, think about whatever you're working on is 
this new technology, blockchain, whether it's permissioned or permissionless, either one, does this new technology really address some pain point that you're trying to solve? Whether it's about payment systems or actually there's a group that's talking about doing supply chain on wine. And I figured, why not? I'll probably approve it. Um, uh, um, but it's what is the pain point that you're actually trying to solve or Will decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networking somehow create a business opportunity and a new model? It might not be a pain point. It might be a business opportunity that decentralized systems solve. Or it might be an opportunity that token economics can help solve. But if there's no pain point you're solving, no token economics, no decentralization peer-to-peer, I ask you to use your critical reasoning and move to the next use case, because this is really about, this is a business class. This is about finding places for this incredible set of new technologies in the context of markets, and, and to have a really healthy sense of ground truth about what's possible. If not, traditional databases move on. I'm not looking for projects at the end of the semester that are using traditional databases. It's got, to lack, it's got to really use blockchain. So I thank you. I'll see you next Thursday.